let's start some recording and let's see if we can do this without clipping too much. It doesn't look clippy clippy to me right now, but let's see how that plays out. Um, okay, I'll have to try to remember to edit this from the front of this recording before I put it online. All right, let's talk about uh, ANOVA and let's walk through, let's see, is this little guy going to work for me? Okay, let's talk about ANOVA again, but this time let's walk through a calculation example beginning example from the beginning to the end. It's not a terribly complex example as ANOVA goes. It's about as minimal as you can get and still be in ANOVA. Uh, and that's a good place to start. So let's go back to the situation we had in a previous lecture where we have the number of children um, that a, a family or a couple chooses to have by political party, sorry, that the couple identifies with. So we had some real limited information there. It was a, a limited study so that the calculations were easy. Nobody would do this in real life, I hope. It's an N of three in each group for an N of nine overall. That's kind of crazy. But our research question is whether people from poli with different political preferences um, systematically differ in the number of children that they have in couples and in families. So that's what we're investigating right now. <clears throat> So let's assume somebody randomly sampled some families, self-identifying as one of three separate political uh, like orientations, parties, that sort of thing. And our hypotheses in ANOVA are always essentially the same. The null hypothesis is always that there is no difference in the population between the means of the things that are, are that the samples came, of the populations that the samples came from, that the individual groups came from. And the alternative hypothesis is that there are differences. So it's kind of hard to make put that in symbols. And because of that, with ANOVA, we don't care as much about making sure everything's all symbol-y, symbol -y. So we can just write things in words. That's OK. And you, you could write the null hypothesis in words, too, if you wanted. You could just say all, mean, all population means are the same. But remember that this is about populations. One of the reasons I emphasize writing things in symbols up until now is so that people remember that this is about populations, that it's not about samples. Hypotheses are always about populations. <coughs> so here's the data. You can see there's just nine observations, but there's some extra information in there too. There's um, the grand mean of all nine op uh, observations and then little group means from three observations at a time coming from each group. The sums are there, which I can't remember why I left them in there. It's not important for right now, but it will be in a minute. So let's set up our ANOVA table. This is where we record our information about the ANOVA, and this is what we're going to put into our document in the results section when we write a re research report of any kind, whether it's a published paper or something for this class. We'll always have an ANOVA table. So we can set it up, and one of the first things we do is figure out the degrees of freedom. This actually is fairly important. The degrees of freedom are critical for determining an F, um, F critical value, which we will do if we are calculating by hand, which we'll do this time through. But they're also important for calculating your mean square based on the sum, well, you start with the sum of squares and divide by degrees of freedom, and then you end up with a mean square. So it's an important thing to get started with. The first degrees of freedom is two, because that's the between subjects degrees of freedom. There are two sources of variance. There's the variance of there's the variance of the individual values that is because of differences between groups. So we call that the between subjects um, source of variance. And then there's the variance that's due to just random sampling, and we call that within subjects variance. So the between subjects variance, if we were to calculate that, which we will for the mean square, it will be sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. And, so, and these degrees of freedom are always an n minus 1. And in this case, the sum of squares is going to be based on the differences of the individual group means from the overall grand mean. And so the degrees of freedom is the number of those things that we're finding the variance of minus one. And in this case, we're only finding the variance of three means. So three minus one, that gives you two. So k minus two, or sorry, k minus one, as you see up there on the slide, k just means the number of groups. So the degrees of freedom within, it will be 6. And that's because it's essentially n minus 1, n minus 1, n minus 1. So n minus 1 for group 1 plus n minus 1 for group 2 plus n minus 1 for group 3. Because within groups, variance is an averaging of all of the individual 
variances inside each of the, the individual groups. We have three groups, and each of those variances has an n minus 1 as its degrees of freedom, what you divide it by to make it into a variance. So you add all those up, because you're going to add them up, and then you're going to divide by the, all the n's, etc. So the degrees of freedom is um, 6 for here, and you could figure that out instead of n minus 1, n minus 1, n minus 1, you can calculate that by taking the total number of observations and subtracting from that the number of groups, so n minus k, so big N minus k. And if you want to calculate the total degrees of freedom, you can. It's not part of the analysis. The, the total line there isn't a separate source of variance. It's just a place that we used to be able to check some of our work when we were doing this by hand. <coughs> And uh, now it exists because some people still find it useful. But for doing things by hand, calculating sum of squares total is actually kind of important. But we're not going to calculate a mean square total or anything like that. And when, when we don't use software, we need an F critical. If we can't find a specific P value, then we need a critical F so that we at least know whether our P is greater than or less than our alpha, so 0.05 or 0.01. In this case, 0.05, because we chose that as our alpha for this analysis. The only reason you need F critical is because you can't get specific information about P. Now, it's actually quite easy to get specific information about P if you have any kind of software at all that's reasonably intelligent. Um, so this is a leftover from the days of tables, but I guess it works for students who don't necessarily have laptops at their desks all the time. So uh, yeah, we're going to use f-critical for our hand calculations. You don't need to find that if you're using software because you just get the p-value and say is it less than 0.05 or is it less than 0.01. The f-critical is only for people who can't find p-values. So there's no f-table in your textbook, so we had to find one. I found one online. There's about a million of them. I put it on Angel, that you should, and you should be able to access it right now. You can use any F table that you want as long as you know how to read it. Uh, you need you need to know two things to read an F table. You need to know degrees of freedom between and degrees of freedom within. Now but degrees of freedom between is the numerator of the F ratio. So it's the degrees of freedom that go with the between subjects uh, sum of squares, the source of variance. And degrees of freedom within is the denominator. So it goes with the within subjects source of variance. So our, in our case it's going to be 2 and 6. So the first thing we do with this particular table, now they're, they're trying to pack in three or four dimensions of information into a two-dimensional page. So they always do, all the tables do something interesting to try and come up with a clever arrangement of values. This one has the p-values for the critical levels in order. So the first couple of pages are, or sorry, the alpha levels. The, uh, the first two pages are alpha is 0.10, and then you have two pages of alpha is 0.05, and then you have alpha is 0.01. Our alpha is 0.05, so on the first page, we'll find the degrees of freedom that we need. So we got the right page, alpha is 0.05, because that's what our study is uh, specified. That's what we decided as researchers. So then we need to find how to locate this degrees of freedom between, degrees of freedom within, how to figure out what they're talking about in their, in their table here. So D1 in this particular case, that's how they're referring to the degrees of freedom between. Some tables will say numerator or numerator degrees of freedom and denominator. Numerator means between, denominator means within. This table says um, D1 and D2. So degrees of freedom between is going to be D1. So that's going to be our column because our degrees of freedom for the between subjects effect in our ANOVA is 2. And then we find the row for the degrees of freedom within, and you probably figured this out already. And in this table, they call that D2, the denominator. Now, that's all explained, I believe, in the instructions for the table, which are about a page long. And you can look at that if you like. So at the intersection of those two things, we have six within subject degrees of freedom and two between subjects, degrees, between groups degrees of freedom, sorry. And so our critical value is going to be 5.14. So if our f value is greater than that, then we reject the null hypothesis. So here's our ANOVA table now. This is what it looks like. We've got our degrees of freedom, and we're set up to start calculating. There's our critical f value. f critical for alpha 0.05, 2, and 6 degrees of freedom. Sometimes we put degrees of freedom in parentheses. Sometimes we put them as subscripts. I sort of feel like it, parentheses are for people who couldn't figure out how to make Microsoft Word do subscripts, but it's becoming pretty popular, so maybe not. So let's figure out sum of squares. That's actually the heavy lifting. That's, that's the stuff that takes some work to calculate in an analysis of variance. When people think of all the calculations in the ANOVA, they're thinking of the sum of squares. So we need to find two sum of squares, really. We need to find within and between. 
but within is kind of a pain in the butt to find. So instead of finding it directly, we're just going to find total in between and take total minus between to find within. Because between plus within always equals total. It's mathematically necessary that in a between subjects one way ANOVA, the sum of squares between and the sum of squares within have to add up. And in fact, the formulas have been constructed so that that always happens. So if you look here, you can see that the between subjects sum of squares, the conceptual formula, don't use this to calculate, unless you really want to, it'll work, it just takes longer and you make more errors and more rounding errors. But um, this right here, this is the heart of what we're interested in. This is the variance between the means. And this, the within subjects effect here, the within subjects variance, this is the variance within the means. Now let's look and make sure that we've got these instructions here for reading these things, but let's just kind of walk through what some of these things mean here. This, the variance within each group, you've got a sum over j. Think of j as the columns in the data matrix. So there are three columns, there are three groups, and i as the rows. So when you have an ij, it means everybody. It means all nine people in this case. And so right here, we say, we see x bar j, that just means the mean of whatever particular group you're looking at. So this isn't the grand mean, and it certainly isn't a mean of like a row or something weird like that. It's a mean of one group. It's a mean of a column in the data matrix. And this odd data matrix that we're set up with, which we won't use for the computer, it's just kind of conceptually what we do. So these two sums means first you sum across one thing, and then when you're done with that, you add all those things together with the second summation. So what this is saying is you calculate the variance, well, the numerator of the variance, the sum of the squared deviations of each score from its mean, you add all those up. And so when you've got the sum of the squared deviations of the scores from mean one, from group one, then you go to group two and come and find the same thing, and then you go to group three and find the same thing. And then when you're done with that, you come back to this part right here, and you add those things up together. And then when you divide those by the degrees of freedom within, then you have the average within group variance. So we've got to figure out the sum of squares first before we can get an average, so we can get the variance there. That's going to be the mean square. So we, and then the, um, the total sum of squares, we'll talk about that in a minute. But look over here at these computational formulas, please. We talked about this in class if you were there. The computational formulas are algebraic manipulations of the conceptual formulas. The conceptual formulas are how the mathematicians figured out and came up with these computa computations in the first place to figure out these things we want to know. But the computational formulas are easier to do by hand. So if you're going to do anything by hand, you'll work less and you will uh, make fewer errors probably and your numbers will have less rounding, uh, fewer chances that you have to round them and then add those rounded values. So you're more likely to have accurate values. And people have thought about this for about 120, 150 years, 120 years, I guess now. So it's, uh, it's a well-refined art of doing this by hand. And I just imagine those people who worked on this for their whole lives and then computers came along and they were like, damn it, I spent 10 years perfecting the by hand calculations. But they're still important because students still need to do things by hand. And I agree. I think you need to do things by hand a few times anyway. So anyway, um, you notice you're just squaring values here. There's no deviations. There's no x minus x bar or anything. You're just squaring things and dividing by n. And down here, you're just squaring things. And then here, you're summing things up and squaring them because algebraically, you can manipulate that so that that works. So let's look at these one at a time. Let's find sum of squares total first. Sum of squares total, uh, we could do between first, but let's find total first because when you find sum of squares total or between, one of the components that you find can be reused for the other one. So it's convenient sometimes to do total and then between and then do a little subtraction and that gives you within. So sum of squares total, let's look at our data matrix here. Sum of squares total is essentially the variance of these nine things from the mean of these nine things uh, without the divided by n minus one bit. So it's just the uh, numerator of the variance formula for all the, all the uh, observations in the entire data. So the definitional formula, that's what it is. Each, you're summing across everything. For each item, for each observation, you subtract it from the mean of all the observations, you square that. Now if you took one step further and divided it by n minus one, then you'd have the variance of everything. And you will, in fact. Uh, you could do that. You could take the degrees of freedom total and divide the sum of squares total by the degrees of freedom total. It's just nobody cares. I, that would be neat. Yay. That's the variance of everything in the study. If you think about it, you realize that is rarely interesting. 
But algebraically equivalent, we've got this. You add up all the squared values, so you square them first, and then add them because of order of operations, and then you sum up all the values, and then you square them. So square then sum, sum and then square. But then when you sum and then square, you divide by nine, by the total n in the entire study. So let's do that here. Here's the formula down here at the bottom. So first let's do the squaring and summing. It's just going to go le left to right. So for that we have to square everything first. This is one way to set it up. You can just put an extra little x squared column beside all of your regular raw scores. So 1 is 1 squared is 1, 0 squared is 0, 2 squared is 4, etc. So we square all the um, all the values in the first group, the second group, the third group. We could put them all in one big column if you really wanted to, but to minimize your effort you can just kind of leave them like this if you want also. So we add up those squared values. 4 plus 1 is 5, 25, 4 and 16 make 45, etc. And then you add those things together. So you'll have all the squared values. That's 85. So if you square all, the, all nine values in this study and then add up the squared values, you get 85. So did you see how that worked there? The sum of x squared. You square things first, then you sum them. So then let's tackle the next piece. This is the sum of x quantity squared. That's, that's how my professor used to say. When you say quantity, it's like you're verbally putting parentheses around things. That means you sum things first and then square them. So now we just add things up. So 1, 0, and 2 make 3, 5, 2, and 4 make 11, 5, 1, and 3 make 9, 3, 11, and 9 make 23. So we square that. So did you see how that worked there? Sum of x quantity squared. Add it up, then square it. So then you divide that by 9 because you're dividing it by the number of observations in the whole study. And when you do that, it works out to be this number, 58.78. When you subtract 85 minus 58.78, you end up with 26.22, and there you go. That's our sum of squares total. It's not so terrible, especially with not very many numbers in the calculations. It's not a really difficult thing to do. So here's our ANOVA table, and now we have the total sum of squares. We're working on it. We're getting things filled in. Now the only things that we need to fill in from the data itself are going to be the sum of squares and the degrees of freedom. All of the mean square, the f, and the p, that will just be within the table itself, and then p will come from f critical, or we'll look it up in a computer or something. So next step, let's find sum of squares between, then after that we'll subtract to get sum of squares within. So here's our data again. The sum of squares between, it's right here, it's each mean considered as if it were just a single observation minus the mean of all the means, so that's the mean of the means, essentially, minus the grand mean, each mean, the deviation of it from its grand mean squared, and you add those things up. So it's basically just the variance of the means from their mean. So it's just treating the means like, like single observations. But you'll notice that this n is right here. So if you were to do this calculation by hand, which you certainly can using the definitional formula, oops, I didn't want that to happen quite yet. Pretend you didn't see that. <coughs> then first, um, when you summed these things up, you'd have to do n. So in group one, you'd have to take the mean of group one minus the grand mean, square that, and then multiply it by three because there are three observations in group one. Then the mean of group two minus the grand mean, square that deviation, and then multiply that deviation by the, by the n of group two, which also happens to be three, and so on for group three. And then add all those things together. The reason you have to multiply like this is because this, the analysis of variance is based on a very apples to apples, oranges to oranges type comparison in the ratio of the two variances. And to make this apples to apples, then both of the variances have to be based on the same number of observations, something like that, or else things get biased and it doesn't make any sense to compare them. So you've got three observations, basically, for the within groups variance, each group gets three votes. Then the between groups variance, each group gets three votes. But it's like a corrupt political system where there's only one big, fat, powerful person, and, and they get three votes because they're really rich or something like that. Anyway, you, you multiply the mean, or the, you multiply the squared deviation by the number of observations that are in that group so that you have equivalent quantities. You don't have to know that stuff that I just said. It's handy, perhaps, but it's not critical for this class. I'm just trying to kind of explain. But what you should recognize is that this is a variance. This is a variance of the means from their mean. This is the average deviation of the means from their mean. But it's only the numerator of this. Later we'll divide this by sum of squares between and it'll be a true variance, which will be the mean square. The computational formula is a whole bunch of pieces like that other one we saw. 
You sum things up, you square them, divide them by their n. Sum things up and square them, divide them by n. And then we subtract that piece that we already calculated, which was 58 something, blah, 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 I can't remember already. And you subtract that one out. Just algebraically, that's how it works out. This is equivalent to this. So let's put this formula in here. Let's see what we can figure out to do. There will be three groups. So there will be three groups of those sum of x quantity squared minus n of the group. So we'll do it first for the first group, three. 3 squared divided by 3. The next group, the sum of 5, 2, and 4 is 11, so we have 11 squared divided by 3. And then for the tea party group, you have 5 plus 1 plus 3, 9, 9 squared divided by 3. So you work those things out, and then you subtract that quantity we already worked out before, which turns out to be 58.78, and that's not an individual group, that's the sum of all the values squared divided by 9, the n in the total study. So when you work that out, if I did the math right, and I'm never 100% sure, but let me know, then you get 11.56, at least I hope you do. And that is our sum of squares between. Now we're just missing sum of squares within, and there are ways to calculate this by hand, but the most popular way to calculate it by hand is the least effort intensive. So the definitional formula of sum of squares between, like I mentioned, is coming up with the, the variance, or at least the sum of squares of each individual group, and then summing together the, the three separate sums of squares. So there's no deviation from the grand mean here, it's individual deviations from your own mean, and then um, adding up those deviations, those squared deviations. But the computational formula is super easy. So sum of squares total minus the sum of squares between. We already figured that out, total was 26.22, between was 11.56, so we have 14.67. Easy peasy. So now our, our NOVA table is filled in, and the hard work is now done. I mean, that's it. When everything else is pretty easy, you need to be careful, don't make any dumb mistakes and check your work, but the hard work is done. So from here, we would figure out the mean square. The mean square is the actual variance. The mean square between is the actual variance of, or our best estimate of the variance between groups, uh, between group means, and the mean square within is the variance within groups. So it's our estimate of sampling error, random error, random variance, that kind of thing. So mean square between, you just take sum of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. Then you got mean square between. There you go. 11, 11 and a half divided by 2 is like 5 and 3 quarters, more or less, so 5.78. Sum of squares within divided by its degrees of freedom. There you go, you got 2.44. It gets a lot smaller when you have a big degrees of freedom, so that's a visual reminder of the importance of sample size. You might have a huge sum of squares within and you're thinking, oh wow, that's going to be a big denominator, so my F ratio is going to be really small, so I won't have a significant p-value. But then if you have a huge degrees of freedom, you divide it and maybe you find out that your mean square within, and that's the important part, might be very, very small. So. Nobody really cares about all this stuff except other researchers and teachers checking your work. But uh, we start to care right now because we calculate F. This is our observed F value and we do mean square between divided by mean square within. So 5.78 divided by 2.44. You get 2.36 if I did this right. And at this point, we need to find out the p-value. Now there's an easy way to find out the p-value and that easy way is R. So. I started up R here. R has all sorts of little functions because mathematicians love to do this. PF stands for probability in the F distribution. So our F observed is 2.36. Our degrees of freedom between is two. Now this does have to go first. And within is six. Now if we do that, we'll get actually the left side of the F distribution because mathematicians are sticklers about counting from bottom to top. So you can do one or two things. You can do one minus this, and that's our actual p-value, 0.175. So you see that's not less than 0.05, so we're not gonna reject the null hypothesis. Or you can add an extra argument here. You'd have to look in the help files to find this, but or memorize it, but you, a lot of these things have this argument. Lower dot tail equals true, all in capital letters. Oh no, <laughs> I don't want the lower tail, I want not the lower tail. And I can spell false. There we go, 0.175. Anyway, we're not gonna find out that exact p-value here, but we do know that the p is not less than 0.05 because f critical was 
and our F observed is not that big. It's always bigger is better with F. You find an F critical, and if you find an, an F observed that's bigger than that, then P is less than alpha. You reject the null hypothesis. So it's not less than alpha here. So we fail to reject this null hypothesis. Boo-hoo, go home. We didn't prove our highly prejudiced and stereotyped and kind of bigoted thoughts about people of political parties and the number of children that they have. It was pretty judgmental, actually, to be honest. So re returning to our hypotheses, what did we reject? We rejected that null hypothesis that said, or not, we rejected nothing. We failed to reject that null hypothesis said, that said that the population means should be the same uh, with the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Tea Party. So a conclusion might be something like, like what's written up there. And notice that I have tried to avoid causal language. There was no random assignment in this, so this study was not a true experiment. It would be weird to randomly assign certain people to have certain numbers of children or randomly assign them. Oh, in this case, it would be randomly assigning people to become members and develop ideology of a different party. It sounds pretty hard to force. Even, even like, Mao Zedong didn't have a really great time with that, actually. No, maybe he did. I don't know. But anyway, it's a little unethical. So, uh, yeah, we avoid causal language. We just say that there's covariation. We're using language of correlation, not of causation here. It differs by political party. It didn't, it wasn't influenced by, it wasn't caused by, it didn't lead to, nothing like that. It just differs by. That's just saying it happens to be this different way. Well, it actually doesn't happen to be, but we still are careful not to in, uh, imply causation. So in summary, you use the F table to find an F critical, which you only do if you're not using a computer. You calculate sum of squares total, calculate sum of squares between, do a little subtraction to find within, and then in the ANOVA table, you just use those values, total and between and degrees of freedom to find the mean squares, and then you find the F observed with a quick division, and then you compare P to alpha in one of two ways. If you're doing this all by hand, you just compare F observed to F critical. It gives you minimal information about P versus alpha. If F observed is greater than F critical, then P is less than alpha. If not, then P is greater than alpha. But if you're doing this by computer, there's no F critical. You just look at alpha, or sorry, you just look at P. The computer will say P is 0 0.175, something like that. So remember, there's no F critical or T critical or Z critical or anything like that if you're doing things on a computer. So the next steps we have, if the F is statistically significant, which it was not in this case, um, another way to say that is if the omnibus test is statistically significant, another way to say it is if P is less than alpha, because these all imply the exact same outcome. They imply that we rejected the null hypothesis. If anything like that, it, no matter how you say it, if, if there was a statistically significant outcome from F, then we can do post hoc tests if we want to. Not everybody wants to. Not every ANOVA needs post hoc tests. Sometimes the ANOVA tells you what you want to know, but sometimes it doesn't. And a post hoc test is comparing individual means two by two. In uh, there are more complicated ways to do it, like comparing averages of this to average of that. But we're just going to talk about pairs of means, doing t tests between pairs of means. And this is a between subjects and NOVA, so they would all be between samples, two samples, um, independent samples, t tests. Couldn't get the right words there. So we could compare individual means if the ANOVA were statistically significant, if the F test were significant. Well, it wasn't, so we can't. So it's not significant, so we stop. Just like this video is stopping.